Today, I'm so excited to talk to y'all about arpilleras and women in politics through art. And let's go ahead and get started. So before I begin, I'd like to issue a land acknowledgement as the UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We are honored to share this space with them and we thank them for their stewardship. As well, I'd like to issue a disclaimer. I am using Google captionings, so sometimes the wordings are not completely right, just so y'all are aware. Okay. So here's a little quick overview of what we'll be going through in this presentation. First, I'll give a really simple breakdown of what arpilleras are, kind of translate it into English. Then we'll go over the history and how the art style came to fruition. We'll talk about different setbacks that came along with arpilleras as they were being created. We'll also talk about the different themes that women started to put and implement within their arpilleras. Finally, we'll go over a few um, specific examples and kind of like break those down and have a discussion on everyone's opinions and all that good stuff. And then finally, we'll just conclude and talk about the impact that Arpilleras made in the world. Okay. So to begin, Arpillera is simply the Spanish word for burlap or quilt. There really isn't an exact definite or translation for it, but that's as close as you can get to it. So in the 70s and 80s, Arpilleras were these really vibrant and colorful patchworks that oppressed women were created, um, were creating as they lived through the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet in Chile. And so I have a really quick discussion question for y'all is, have you heard of Augusto Pinochet? What do you know about him? I've also included this picture if you're more of a, I know people's faces <laughs> instead of their names. Um, but yeah, feel free to just hop in the chat. You can also just say like, I have never heard of this man in my life, um, but I'd love to hear what y'all know about Pinochet. So we have Brianna who hasn't. I've never heard of this man in my life, for sure. Not much, but I assume he's a dictator. Yes, definitely. Yes, he led Chile. Same, I haven't heard of him. Chile, yeah, okay, that's really interesting. Talked about him in high school, but don't remember specifics. Dictator who the US supported. I'm not sure who he is. I have heard of him, but mostly I know him as a Chilean dictator. No, no idea, a little familiar without a lot of specifics. So yeah, a lot of y'all's take on Pinochet, I think is the general consensus is like, Oh, I've heard of him, but not really know enough to be like, yeah, I know who this person is. So I'll give y'all a quick breakdown of who he is. Augusto Jose Ramon Pinochet Ugarte was a Chilean president through dictatorship for 17 years after he led a coup that took over the presidential palace called La Moneda. So let's get into a little bit of history. So before Pinochet came to the picture, Chile had had an orderly and democratic government, governmental institution for about 130 years. So, you know, they were doing so good. <laughs> and then the 1970 election came about and Salvador Allende, who was a known socialist, a known Marxist, he ran for president and he actually got most of the votes. He got about 36% of the votes from the Chilean people. However, since that wasn't 50%, it wasn't considered a majority. So in Chile, what happens is a small group of congressmen kind of end up deciding who they'll establish as president. And considering that Chile's election took place during the Cold War, the US was 
looking really close into what was going on. They were kind of keeping tabs on the presidential election. Um, and so when they found that he didn't get the majority, Nixon and Kissinger kind of like got involved and they were trying to persuade the congressmen who were going to decide who was going to become president. They were kind of swayed them to pick anybody else but Allende because he was a socialist. Um, but they wouldn't budge. And then there was kind of like an attempted coup that ended up with the death of a Chilean military leader, um, Rene Schneider. And when he was killed, um, that was kind of the last straw for the Congress. And they just established Allende as president, not to, so they wouldn't have to deal with any repercussion, repercussions from the Chilean people. Chile under Allende was actually the first Western country to be led by a Marxist, um, and especially through a freely elected um, election. So it was the very first of its kind. And he got to serve for three years, from November 3rd, 1970 to September 11, 1973, which is when the coup took place. It's important to know that throughout those three years, um, the United States completely cut off all trade with Chile. So the Chilean economy kind of suffered through that. Okay. So this is a really, really brief timeline of what happened. So obviously in 1973, the coup took place and Pinochet overthrew Chile's socialist government. The US secretly approved and aided this coup because they had told Pinochet that he would lead in the presidency for a year and then he would defer the presidential position to members of the army, navy. Um, obviously that didn't happen. Within his first three years of being president, Pinochet arrested and tortured approximately 130,000 people. So these were mostly men. And a lot of the time, the women, the women that were left behind who lost their husbands, who lost their fathers or who lost their sons, they didn't actually end up knowing what ever happened to, to the men in their family. Uh, then in 1981, um, Pinochet was convinced by members of Congress to create a constitution that would actually establish eight-year presidential terms. He was pretty sure that he wouldn't be voted out because he wasn't going to allow for any meaningful political opposition. So in eight years, when that election came up, he was like, I'm going to get you know, elected back into office. Um, but that wasn't the case, despite not having any real opposition, he still lost office. And in 1989, another present took place in Chile. So I just want to show you all this little four minute video by Japsy, which really breaks down the Chilean coup better than I could have. So let me just do that. In the 1960s, Chile was a democratic nation, despite many of their neighbors being under dictatorships in the mid 20th century. But the Americans became heavily involved in politics in Latin America since the Cuban Revolution. And through projects like the Alliance for Progress, millions of dollars were sent out to their allies, like Betancourt in Venezuela. Plus, the CIA also helped start coups in countries like Bolivia and Brazil. And in Chile, in 1964, they sent money to help Montalva win an election against Salvador Allende, a socialist. However, in Chile, no presidents can serve two terms. So, in 1970, Montalva was forced to step down. His party, the Christian Democratic Party, was taken over by Radomiro Tomic. He, however, came in third during the election losing to former presidents George Alessandri and Salvador Allende. But no candidate won an outright majority, so the National Congress had to pick a leader. The CIA tried to get the National Congress to select George Alessandri, only to have him later resign and bring Montalva into power once again. But the National Congress chose Allende, and he began to implement many socialist reforms. These helped bolster his popularity, but the Americans withdrew aid to Chile, and the country suffered through mass inflation. Plus, his close connections with socialist leaders like Castro worried many on the right. 
So in Parliament, they united to form the Confederation of Democracy and stopped further reforms. And the CIA helped fund opposition to Allende, like the El Mercurio newspaper, which called for him to be overthrown. He also had very little support from the largely right-wing military officers, who lived in a relatively closed-off community. But these officers still had a great deal of political influence. For instance, 1969 soldiers rose up to demand higher wages as part of the Tecnazo insurrection. However, the new army commander-in-chief, René Schneider, promised to keep the military out of politics when Allende was elected. This angered those that believed Allende was poised to install a communist dictatorship, so Schneider was assassinated just a year later. His replacement, Carlos Pratt, maintained this policy, but still paramilitary groups like Fatherland and Liberty were formed. And after a couple years of rising tensions, Colonel Super took his tank regiment to the presidential palace in June 1973. Although this coup failed, it became apparent that without the support of the military and national police, Allende could not restore order, and the poor economy led to strikes breaking out around the country. The wives of military officers protested outside Pratt's house and he was forced to resign and was replaced by Augustus Pinochet. Then the members of the Confederacy of Democracy voted to ask if ministers and military could put an end to Allende's alleged unconstitutional practices. Allende responded by saying that he had acted constitutionally, said the vote was so in disorder, and in early September promised to hold a referendum on his policies. Fearing that the country would become even more left-wing, the head of the Navy, Jose Toribio Marino, got support from the newly appointed heads of the Air Force, Gustavo Lee, and Police Force Cesar Mendoza. And then, with Augustus Pinochet, they launched a coup early in the morning of September 11th. Commandos blockaded the port of Valparaiso while the Army and Air Force took out radio and TV stations. Allende retreated to the presidential palace with members of the military that remained loyal but now he had very little communication with the rest of the country. By 9am, the military declared that they had taken over most of the country and called for Allende to resign. He, however, refused to resign and also refused offers to escape the capital to lead a counter coup later on. Instead, he waited within the presidential palace as fighting in the capital continued for a few hours and the palace was bombed. It is believed he committed suicide within the palace just before it was captured by the military. With Allende gone, Pinochet, Marino, Mendoza and Lee initially shared power as part of the military government and suspended the constitution in Congress and banned opposing political parties. Pinochet, as head of the army, was made head of this junta and eventually consolidated power and made himself president. And he would go on to arrest tens of thousands of political enemies, many of which were infamously held in the national stadium and killed many political opponents. The American role in the coup is disputed, but it is said that they helped fan the flames beforehand and helped justify the coup by spreading the idea that Allende was planning a Marxist self-coup as part of Plan Zeta. The Americans did, however, maintain close relations with Pinochet, who ruled Chile until 1990. Alrighty, before we continue, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the American intervention within Chile and kind of just their role within this coup. What do you think? Do you think they were acting in the right? Do you think they shouldn't have gotten involved? So we have our first comment, America, America just needs to mind its own business, but they never do. America be meddling. Yeah, they really like to get involved. And especially since they were going through the Cold War with Russia at this time, they didn't really want any kind of socialist or leftist influence in the Western world. This sounds so similar to what happened in Iran in the, in the 50s by interfering with a democratic leader rising in power. Wow, I haven't heard about that. That sounds really interesting. I don't know if it was right, but I am not surprised by their intervention. I think they shouldn't interfere and then not take responsibility afterwards. The, beer, the big fear of Marxism by Americans. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting, you know, they interfered and then afterwards despite seeing that Pinochet was, you know, men were going missing and people were being tortured, they still held close relations with the economy, they still traded with Chile, something that they wouldn't do with the Marxist government, um, even though nothing like that was happening under Allende. So thank you all for sharing. Let's go on. No. Okay, so now we're gonna get into Arpillera. So that was just a little bit of background information. 
And now we're going to talk about this. So as I've mentioned briefly, many women lost their husbands, brothers, and sons to death or imprisonment. And so they kind of ended up just getting together and sharing their burdens through tapestries. They started sewing and creating these arpilleras. So this is actually a real photo from the 70s when women would get together and just do all of this stitch work. And then as you can see below, we have an arpillera that was created. You can see they referenced the missing men by having these unmarked figures with no type of characteristics and just a question mark. So another discussion question, what type of obstacles do you think they would face in their artivism? The arpilleristas, obviously they're under a dictatorship and Dictators generally don't like seeing any type of opposition. So I'd love to hear what y'all think they faced as obstacles or setbacks, house arrest, safety issues. Honestly, I think they risked their lives creating this art. Yeah, I mean, they were willing to take men away um, for even the, the chance or the thought that they might be political um, oppositions, displaying them in public spaces without consequences. Maybe it was also a form of resistance for them, ostracism. Yeah, definitely. And these are consequences from the government, but you can also think about consequences within their own lives. I imagine that they had to keep them private or risk death, definitely. Okay, so. Thank you all so much. I love all the thoughts. Oh, we have one more. Were the men in power even paying attention to these women's arts? Did it take long? Did it take a long time for them to notice? So yes, and we'll be talking about that. Um, they did know that these arts were being created. So obviously they were forbidden. Um, it was traitor's work and the women never actually signed their work. They never showed any type of um, signature. You know, typically in art, you you show. You know, you sign it. You claim it as your own. Um, oh, there's a question. What was Chilean art scene like prior? I can't say that I know much about the Chilean art scene before. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. I, sorry about that. Okay, but scarcity after the coup, after Pinochet took over, wool, which is the primary type of thing they used to create these arpilleras, uh, was really scarce. And so what they actually did was a fabric applique method in which they layered different patches and stitched them together. And actually something that was really interesting that they did was that they took the shirts or the clothing of their missing family members and they used them for the sky or they used them for the clothing and the little people that were in their arpilleras. And the arpilleras actually did help women financially. Um, the church that sold the pieces for them, they, she, the church sold them outside of Chile, would give the money back to the women who created them, but they were limited to one arpiera a week unless they had severe financial need. And the reality is that because they didn't have their husbands or their fathers, a lot of these women were in deep financial need. They had to rely on each other to eat, to take care of their children, to find work. Which church sold them? So it was the Catholic church. It, there's no specific church. It was kind of like churches all over, but they, they were all Catholic churches. And actually, even though you think that it would be the government who censored them, the church was actually the one who censored the women. So within their artwork, they were limited in what they could show. They didn't want to risk the lives of the women. So while they supported political resistance, they wouldn't allow for 
anything too explicit or too political. Um, they thought that if anything was really strongly and explicitly depicting Chile in bad light or showing what was going on, that the church would be targeted or the women themselves would be affected and their lives would be put at risk. They also didn't let the women to sew in any words that they wouldn't find within the streets. So you'll see that in the arpilleras under the church, if they did want to add words, they would create banners. They wouldn't just stitch it onto the, onto the piece. There's also a lot of common elements that you'll find within the arpilleras. So one that's really big is the Andes. So these are the mountains that are in Chile. And this is just to tell everyone in the world that this oppression that they're witnessing, these horrible things are happening in Chile. They wanted to give a setting to it. So if we go back to that first um, arpillera, you'll see that the mountains are there. They also would establish a lot of the communal um, support and spaces that they had. So you'll see big, pedal, big kettles, which were the community soup pots. And that's kind of what they lived off of and what they ate to get by. You'll also see laundries or bakeries that women used to support each other, that they, you know, it's like the laundry owner would be like, oh, I'll let you wash your clothes if you give me some bread, kind of, that kind of thing. And sometimes you'd also see hospitals, but they weren't in positive lighting. You'd actually see hospitals being crossed off with an X because families of people who had disappeared wouldn't be allowed to use the hospitals for any reason. You were kind of um, ostracized from even getting healthcare. I also wanted to show, so here you see the, the mountains in the back. Um, and as you can see the banner as well, because they couldn't write any specific words just onto the, onto the arpillera. But another common element that you'll see, and there's some examples in the future that maybe you'll pick up on, were these electric lines. And the women would illegally hook up electricity to their houses because they couldn't afford to pay it. But obviously you need light, you need all types of electricity to just live and exist. And so what they would do is they would hook them up to their houses um, at night and they would make sure to unhook them in the dawn. Because if the police would see the electric lines being hooked up to the houses, they would probably be arrested um, or taken away. And so they would rather risk electrocution than arrest. You also see the eggs that they would stitch onto hospitals. We see it in the police car to mark that, you know, the police wasn't there to help them they were actually endangered by the police. Okay, so now we have a two minute clip from a seven minute video by Foraging, Foraging Memory, who interviews Veronica Sanchez. She's, the, she's in charge of the Ar Arpilleras collection in the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Chile. Por lo general, las temáticas que cruzan, que atraviesan los derechos humanos. Tenemos la cesantía, el, porque era, era muy fuerte en los años 80 la cesantía y lo que provoca es cuando están presos los hombres, que eran muchas veces el pilar de la, de la familia, provocó más, mayor pobreza y mayor, no tenían el recurso del sustento económico base las familias para en, su, en sus hogares. Pero también están las ollas comunes, como las... Como las, las las poblaciones se fueron rearticulando y cómo se fueron ayudando para subsistir. Entonces, en, por ejemplo, en ollas comunes o comedores infantiles tenemos ocho piezas en las diversas colecciones que tenemos. También están representados las manifestaciones públicas cuando están con las pancartas. Por un lado están los liber, libertad a los presos políticos, que se ve muchas veces la, el cartel. Y por otro lado tenemos los dónde están todas las familias de víctimas con el cartel de su familia y ese signo de interrogación donde, donde están. Yo creo que donde están de la deten, deten, detenido desaparecido tendremos más de 20 piezas referidos a esa temática. También tenemos la, las velatones, 
que se expresan las velas prendidas en las calles, eh, los encadenamientos de mujeres. Tenemos tres, cuatro piezas de los encadenamientos porque fue una, una fórmula que encontraron los familiares de víctimas para hacer presión en la sociedad, fue encadenarse, tanto en el ex Congreso Nacional como en la CEPAL, en la oficina CEPAL aquí en Santiago. Tenemos ya más adelante el tema del exilio, representado los aviones que se van con bandera. So I'll briefly go over some of the things that she said. She's just simply talking about the different arpilleras that they have within their collection. And she talks about how, you know, they have like eight pieces with the communal pots within them. They have 20 pieces of women displaying, you know, a cardboard sign with like a man and just like a question mark talking about like, where are they? She talks about how, you know, later on within the dictatorship, um, women would chain themselves to governmental offices And you can see that in certain arpilleras, they actually create arpilleras depicting that. And later on, you also see airplanes to show, you know, when people would go on to exile. I have a question. The people who went missing, was it completely random or were they involved in something that the government disapproved of? So within the first three years, if you were considered of being a leftist or having any sort of political opposition, you'd be the type to get arrested and go missing. But after that, it, it was just kind of for whatever reason, as long as you know you were doing something that the government didn't want or considered like possible threat, you'd be taken, you'd be taken away. I had heard university students were targeted, is that correct? Yes, and we're actually, I'll actually be showing y'all a specific arpillera um, about these teenage protesters. And university students were targeted because they were educating themselves and, you know, debating on the uh, um, governmental rightfulness of Pinochet and if he should have office. They also would protest a lot. And so protesters would also be arrested, taken away. And a lot of people who protest are university students. Okay, later on, so obviously within the first few years when Arpillera started, you had the church style of Arpilleras. So, you know, they were limited, they went censored um, because they were afraid of arrest. So there's three types of Arpilleras. And I've uh, put an example here. You have the common themes of the the mountains in the back, but it's it's still pretty colorful. Uh, within first glance, you don't really think too much of it. It is the men being arrested and taken away, so they are speaking on the oppression that they're witnessing, but it's not anything too explicit. It's not horrible. You could you could look at it and be like, oh, maybe those three men did something wrong. But then certain strong themes started showing up within the arpilleras that actually criticized Chile and showed the brutalities that were occurring. So this is actually an arpillera talking about September 11th of 1973. This is supposed to represent the palace, La Moneda. And so you see the airplanes above, which are dropping bombs all over the city. You see the, the military attacking its own palace and all of the blood. It's, it's a much darker image. It's not as colorful as the image above. And so it's very explicit in criticizing uh, the government. And there was actually arpilleras that were made that were to be considered pro Chile. So the government saw these arpilleras, they saw that they were being distributed to the world outside. And so they actually created workshops that would produce Chile with happy themes and a positive light. I don't actually have an example of that because some women did create arpilleras that depicted a happy life, but not because they were saying like, oh, this is life in Chile. Rather, they were like kind of just dreaming and fantasizing of what their lives would be like if Pinochet had never 
come to office. So it's it's hard to tell which um, atvilleras are government sanctioned, trying to convince the world that, hey, if not all bad, these people are just really angry for whatever reason, but we're actually enjoying it here versus arpilleristas creating these, these pieces of art just depicting what they hoped their lives would be like. Okay. So now we're going to talk about specific examples. And this is actually the piece that I was referring to when somebody mentioned university students. So, you know, if anyone wants to comment in the chat, anything they see within the arpillera or they want to know more, please feel free ahead. Feel free to do that. But um, I'll just give you all a little overview of this. So this is the story of Carmen, Carmen Gloria Quintana and Rodrigo Rojas. So you can see them in these pictures here on the side. They were teenage protesters. I believe they were like 19, 20. So they were university students. And they're the people here at the center. They were tortured and burned in 1986. And Rodrigo Rojas actually ended up dying. Oh, um, sorry, I briefly left and missed this last slide. The three types of arpilleras. Yeah, so I can go back really quick. So we have the kind of the timid church there. They didn't wanna explicitly criticize the government um, fearing that they would be arrested or go missing as well. We also have very strong explicit themes that would be created later on within the dictatorship when they were just tired and really wanted to show the oppression that they witnessed. And then we also had the Pro Chile Arpilleras where government sanctioned workshops would produce their own arpilleras to try to convince the world that it wasn't all bad, but some of arpilleras that were producing these happy themes were actually not because they were saying that Chile was good and positive, but rather they were fantasizing about what their lives would be like um, if the dictatorship and Pinochet's rule had never come to Chile. So that's just really fast. Okay, all right. So just to get back on this, this is um, a teenage protest in 1986 where Carmen um, Quintana and Rodrigo Rojas were being tortured and they were burned alive actually um, Rodrigo actually ended up dying, um, but Carmen Quintana didn't. She just suffered burns all over her body and she had to be flown to Canada to get reconstructive surgeries. And she's actually still alive to this day. And she speaks about the oppression. So this is another, um, this is another, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat really briefly. This is another arpillera that was produced. And this one, we actually know who produced it. Her name is Violeta Morales. Um, she made this quilt in English. It's titled, Did You Forget? If you have no memory, you will vote again for Pinochet. So she's actually alluding to the 1988 elections. So you can see here, they have the names of different men that went missing. And they have the name such as Newton Morales, and then below it, it says, did you forget me? Yes, no. And that's the case for every single, you know, man, although they don't really have an identity and it's meant to represent all of the men who went missing. Um, at the top, you know, you can see these and think they're just um, apartment buildings, but the artist reveals that the, antennas that were at the top of the buildings were also to, meant to resemble and represent the unmarked graves of all of the men that were buried and their wives just never found out or their daughters um, never found out what happened to them. There's massive grave sites in Santiago and all over Chile with just these types of grave markings. And as you know, as I mentioned, this one we actually know who the artist was because 
It was nearing the end of Pinochet's rule. That's when arpilleras with more explicit themes were being broadcasted and, and they weren't as afraid to just attack and criticize the government. Okay. So I'm going to be showing more um, arpilleras after this, but I just wanna, you know, get your input. What are some of the things you notice in the following arpilleras? Maybe your interpretation of it. I, there's no specific backstory to it. The women who chained themselves to government buildings, did the government actually release information to them? Did it work? No. Um, and a lot of the time, sometimes they were left and they were allowed to just go back to their homes. But a lot of the time, especially early on within the dictatorship, they too would be taken and arrested and they went missing as well. That's why community was a big part during this time. The communal soup pots, all of that. It was just women taking care of each other, taking care of each other's kids. Sometimes kids were left without any parents because both of them were just fighting the oppression and they were taken away. The art themselves feels very familiar, like something, like something a grandma or auntie would make and it makes them more stressful to look at for the horrible subjects they depict. Yeah, definitely. And that was, that is kind of the style that they worked through. Um, it's just regular grandmothers, mothers using what they have to show what's going on in the world. I noticed the colors were very bright in many arpilleras, which contrasted with the severity of the issue. Definitely. You look at it and you're expecting something positive and wonderful, and that's just not the case. The last one started with bold colors and the lesson just like memories do. Yeah, that's really true. It's, it's a gradual process. Okay, I'm going to show you some more examples so we can have sort of a discussion. So I'd love to hear any input y'all have on this piece. It is so brave for the women to create these arpilleras. It's like they are trying to honor the lives of the missing and call attention to that, definitely. And it is artivism where they're risking their lives to even create this piece. Um, it's like how women are expected to deal with this, to be happy and brave even when the world is crumbling. Yeah, you take away the head of the household and you expect them to just function and that just wasn't the case. They kind of had to find solidarity, solidarity within each other. This one looks like it's asking a question of how can we live our lives normally when one of our family members is gone? Definitely, you know, it's, it's a regular kitchen. You have the table set up. Does anybody else have something they want to comment on? I'll wait a few minutes. I'm sure some of y'all are typing. You know, how can they go on? They have the place set up, but there's no one there. They still have the table for the man, maybe showing that they're hoping to find him. Yeah, exactly. They're hoping, they set up the play, they're hopeful that maybe it'll be the day that he returns. So on this stand, like they have to go on without even knowing where they are. Yes, yeah, so here, for those of y'all who don't speak Spanish, donde están is, where are they? And you know, it's a, it's a picture resembling a man. I too, I really like Steven's interpretation that they're waiting and hoping that they'll find him. Definitely, it's a more hopeful interpretation for sure. And I'd like to point out that the floor is kind of interesting. So it leads me to believe that maybe it's, it was made with the shirt of a family member um, the windows as well. It's kind of silky <laughs> for sky. Um, it might have been just what they had available or it might be actually their husband's um, clothing. Okay, we'll go to the next one. So I'd love to hear any thoughts about this piece. Anything y'all notice? So we have a comment. I see the electric lines again. Yeah, definitely they're right here, connecting to the homes. 
women doing all the chores. Yeah, it's just the communal, the community. Although we do have some men here, they're typically represented um, by wearing pants. Women are typically with dresses. So we have two men, but it's still mostly women um, within this, our pace. Are people having to move, hugging goodbye? I think those are kids. That's true, these two could be kids. Um, that is a possible um, explanation, hugging goodbye, that they're leaving um, towards the end. A lot of people left, uh, especially if they still had their families together. I see some people doing what, acti what seems like day-to-day -day activities, like the person watering their lawn in the top right. But I think the bottom kind of shows maybe women having to take the responsibilities of the men once they went missing, like the woman in the bottom right corner holding the bag. Wow, yeah, definitely. You know, you have maybe some stereotypical interpretations of women mopping or cooking, but then you also see them taking on the workload that a man generally would have dealing with heavy loads or maybe driving the cars. Um, that's definitely really true. And this isn't a piece that's as explicit. It's it's more hopeful and it also depicts kind of the, the communal living that they had to work with. They had to rely with each other. You also he see the mountains in the back, again, setting, displaying that it's in Chile, it's taking place there, the Andes, definitely. You survive and go on. True, that's another really good interpretation of it. Like over time, you realize even though you may want to continue fighting and continue looking for the lost man, you, you also have to survive yourself. And if you have children, help them survive. They're all limited. I'll wait one more minute for any last thoughts. This piece could be a house or it could also be a bakery because you see the communal pot and just kind of bread. So they may be children or it might also be just women in a bakery. All the dresses have like a line at the hems and the sleeves. Yeah, it's, it, I think it was a common kind of style back then in the 70s and 80s. Definitely more happy and bright colors. Yeah, a lot of these pieces worked with really bright and vibrant colors, um, which when you look closer, it takes a toll on you. Maybe not this piece specifically, but some of the other pieces when they're being killed or they're being arrested, it takes you a moment to realize that something dark is happening when you have all of these vibrant colors. All right, thank you all so much. Is this a timid church piece? Yeah, this is definitely a timid church piece. You could also think that maybe it's a, a government sanctioned piece simply because, well, actually no, because the electric lines would show that, Never mind. Um, but yeah, this is a timid church piece. It's, it's subtle in uh, its criticism and it's subtle in showing the oppression that they witnessed. So, all right, we've gotten to our conclusion. You know, as we talked, as Arpillera served as artistic proof of the oppression that these women witnessed under Pinochet's dictatorship. It was just depicting their day-to-day -day lives and depicting what having uh, the men in their lives missing did to them and how they had to survive through communal support. After they were sold to the world, other Latin American countries um, adopted the style of arpilleras, such as Peru, Colombia, and Nicaragua. Um, while some of them did use them to depict kind of activism, artivism, and political struggles, some of them just took the style and um, created happy scenes. 
Arbieras were a fight against an oppressive power and a form of artivism. Women shared their painful living experiences and within art they found community, hope and each other. Um, that's really what it did. They found themselves. Art can be a healing, a healing and a voice for issues, definitely. These women had to support each other and they did that by getting together, creating the Arpillera, supporting each other, taking care of each other, taking care of each other's kids. So that's kind of the history and the connection between Chile, politics, women, and art. Yeah, artivism is a really cool term. It's specifically art that's activism. All right, so that leads to the end of my presentation. These are the sources if you'd like to learn more. But before I conclude, if y'all could fill out a quick survey so that we can improve our workshops, I'd absolutely love that. Um, you can take out your phone and just scan the QR code. We can also just write this tiny URL link. Sting has a song for Amnesty International, They Dance Alone. Thank you so much for the presentation. I learned a lot. I'm glad you got to learn. Are they still being made? They're not as common. Um, Arpilleras are still being made, but they don't represent the dictatorship in Chile anymore. Some people create them um, or use the style of Arpilleras to depict their lives, things that are happening in the world, but it's not specifically about Chile anymore. And yes, I'll post the URL in the chat so y'all can have that. Oh, there, thank you. Thank you all so much. Follow us on social media. You can check out us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. We have a lot of different presentations coming up this quarter, and we have a lot of information. Do kids learn about this in school today? Um, in Chile, they do. They have that museum of um, oppression and human rights in Chile, but it's not something that is really typically taught within other countries. We don't learn that here in the United States. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm glad this was informative. <laughs>